is the greatest story in human history. It's never been told. It must be told. And it will be told eventually. And if we can wake people up to realize who they are and why they're here, that'll be a good beginning. We have had an intimate interrelationship with advanced intelligence from the stars from the beginning of human history. And that intimate interrelationship is still underway. So maybe they 
study us from afar. Maybe they abduct the odd person and put them back and try and wipe their memories and some people believe them and some not. But as I say, don't land on the White House lawn because then you get that, that contamination. And to truly advance civilizations in the cosmos, newly emerging civilizations like our own might just be the last interesting thing left in the universe. So perhaps we are fascinating to them on that level. Who are these crazy humans? What are they up to? What are they building? Where are they going? What, what, what do we think their journey will be? Let's follow them. When we speculate about extraterrestrials, my goodness, we can imagine a wide range of possibilities. But you know, my favorite theory is that the real answer, what aliens are doing, where they come from, what they want, what the interaction is, maybe the real answer is something we haven't even thought of yet. question for all Americans. Where did all the money go? That's a good question. Why has our economy bottomed out? Was it by chance? Was it by accident? Was it by mistake? I don't think so. There is something called the Secret Space Program, which was an outgrowth of the discoveries in the 1940s and 1950s of crashed UFO craft that were recovered. The first recovery that I know of occurred in 1940. It was not Roswell. Seven years before Roswell, an alien craft crashed in Port Girardeau, Missouri. The local townspeople saw the crash, came upon it, and pulled out the pilots. And these were such good Christian God-fearing people that even though they recognized that the pilots were foreign, they called the minister to come and administer the last rites to these poor creatures. And a certain Reverend Hoffman was called, and he took off. He met the chief of police, and he saw the body of an alien. And so the army came in and took over the scene. They took the craft. They took the body. That was 1940. In 1947, we all know about the Roswell crash, but there were two other crashes that year, one in Kingman, Arizona, and an earlier one that occurred in April. These crafts were recovered. So this resulted in um, a spurt of activity to reverse engineer these crafts. There was an official investigation that was called Project Sign. This was the first investigation into the Roswell crash. And the conclusion of Project Sign was that we were being visited by people from outer space that had a higher level of civilization and technology than we did. But when this report arrived in Washington to the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, General Hoyt S. Vandenberg, he said, we cannot accept this conclusion. We'll write another paper. And so that paper was quashed and Project Grudge was initiated, which evolved into Project Blue Book in order to keep track of UFO activities, UFO interaction with human beings, and at the same time to cover it up, which is what Project Grudge and Project Blue Book uh, were primarily assigned to do. Catalog all the UFO events, the sightings, the landings, the evidence, procure it all, silence the witnesses, and so that went on for a very long time. However, during the same period of time, UFO activity increased throughout the United States, and it's well known that they have had incursions into our military bases, our nuclear facilities, that they track nuclear submarines, and that they have a very great concern with uh, nuclear weapons and what human beings intend to do with them. So some of them are guardian angels, and then others are not this guardian angels. Some of them were obviously during the 1950s and 60s trying to lure the United States and the Soviet Union into war with each other. So there we have it. We have one faction of aliens that wants to pit mankind against itself in order for us to destroy ourselves through self-immolation in the nuclear holocaust and at the same time 
there's another group of aliens that's showing itself as guardians, protectors of humankind at, at other times, but also giving stern warnings that should we ever be so foolish as to launch a nuclear missile at another country, we cannot be sure where that missile will land. The secret space program evolved out of this. The need for secrecy, hiding the facts of UFO and flying saucer activity, at the same time having to play catch-up with the civilization that was so far ahead of us that it was feared that if its presence were revealed, the Brookings Institution said that the scientists, doctors, and engineers of our society would be so depressed, so despondent, with the futility of having to catch up with a civilization that was at least 200 years ahead of us, that they would be so disheartened that they might not even get up to go to work the next morning. And that is it, in a nutshell. That's a statement in the Brookings Institution report, that science and society would be destabilized by such a revelation. However, the military-industrial complex was not destabilized by any means. They were very stabilized and got to work on reverse engineering the products extracted from the crashed UFOs. This story can be read in Philip Corso's book, The Day After Roswell. Fiber optics, the maser, the laser, anti-gravitational propulsion, all of these things were found in the crashed Roswell disk, the crashed Aztec flying saucer, and several others that have been recovered since that time. So the United States government got to work alongside uh, Canada, and the funding was funneled to the secret space program. And trillions and trillions of dollars were invested. And these trillions and trillions of dollars had to come from somewhere. And as a result, many government programs engaged in black operations. I'm sure you've all heard of many years ago there was an audit done, the United States Air Force and the United States military, and they were finding that the contractors were charging the United States government $1,500 for a hammer, $500 for a toilet seat. So I believe that this is the methodology where all of this money was skimmed off and hidden and funneled into this advanced, very rapid development program to try to catch up with the UFOs, to build our own UFOs based on their reverse engineered technology. And we have been successful. As a result, we have something called the Navy's 10th Fleet. It's masked as a cyber warfare organization, you know, software and computer related. However, the Navy 10th Fleet is the the name of a space fleet, which was discovered, by the way, by Gary McKinnon when he hacked into the NASA computers. He saw the list of 10th Fleet non-terrestrial officers. There were terrestrial officers, and there was a list of non-terrestrial officers. Gary McKinnon made this publicly known, and he suffered dearly for it. He was ultimately protected by the British Parliament that forestalled his extradition to the United States, where the United States government wanted to try him for hacking and spying and revealing classified knowledge. But the British people and the British Parliament protected Gary McKinnon, and uh, he is safe and sound, probably still recovering from his ordeal in England. The secret space program is real. It is siphoning off our national resources, our national wealth, and preparing the public for what may turn out to be a fake alien invasion. That is a danger. That human beings may be wrought up with panic and fear through the use of MK Ultra mind control techniques in the mass media to make us believe that uh, we are being invaded by people from outer space and that we must go to war with them and that we must use nuclear weapons to fight them. 
Well, all of that would lead to self-immolation. That's uh, going up in flames for those of you who don't know. Self-immolation, very bad thing. So it is my hope that we will forestall this, that we will not fall into traps and ploys and false flag attacks and uh, panic at the idea of being invaded by people from outer space. In fact, people from outer space are already amongst us. They've been amongst us for over 70 years. They walk amongst us unrecognized, some of them. And others don't show themselves in the daylight because no one can really bear their presence or their smell. That's been my experience. Certain extraterrestrials have not only a horrible appearance, but have a foul smell that will drive a person into panic. And it takes a very strong mind to hold itself together when uh, assaulted, assailed by horrible smells that are sometimes described as sulfurous, sometimes described as, um, well, beyond description is all I've got to say about that. We don't have to go into more details, but it's, it's something that's very, very damaging to the human being to be in the presence of these beings. And I do not recommend anyone trying to make contact with Space Brothers. I think we should be cautious. We should not be afraid, but we should be cautious. As President Reagan said, trust but verify. I think verify then trust. Telepathic communication is mind to mind. Humans are verbal. We make a lot of noise. But the non-humans appear to have almost instantaneous thought, thought words. They work in symbols. They work in numbers. Whatever is happening in their minds, it's huge downloads all at once. Back in the early 1980s was the first time that I was introduced by a kind of whistleblower person in uh, Army military, active at the time, actually, to the notion that there is a secret war and that the secret war has been ongoing around this planet, in this planet, underneath the surface of this planet for millennia. And that the forces that conflict with each other is a mystery or was a mystery to this man except that our government was very concerned about who are our allies really and who are our enemies and that's the way it was laid out to me and in the process of describing that this man told me that he was involved in a group that they would get some kind of a call and they would go to wherever there was, either a landing or a crash or some sort of interaction with something in the non-human category on this earth. And we've heard about Project Pounce and Moondust and these various groups that since the 1940s, Truman had organized MJ-12, Majestic 12, and that part of their work was to have units that were trained they were uh, top secret, they couldn't talk to anybody, but their jobs were to go to any location on the planet where there might be either a crash or non-humans doing something and we wanted to get there and monitor. And he said, we have been able to send signals to the Ebens, another type that are gray, they have heads that are shaped like a pear, they have eyes that are not black lenses, that they are large and usually dark, but not the lens type. And they sent out a frequency asking for help. And that one of the gray craft went to this town in Arizona, met up with our military people. This man telling me this was firsthand. This was his experience. And he said his superior officer came to him and said, one of the Ebens has agreed to let you, the man who's telling me his firsthand story, have the experience of having a telepathic download so you'll know what it is like. And his superior officer said that they had an agreement. The being knew that humans are very uh, alarmed 
when these creatures float above the ground. That is their preferred uh, state because they have technology that neutralizes gravity. But they know that humans get upset by things that float in the air, and so he said he's agreed to stay on the ground. And when they walk on the ground, they waddle, and it will be funny. It will look like Donald Duck. Be prepared for it. And then he will get to a point where he will start coming toward you in a straight line. At about six to seven feet away, he will stop. You will want to run. You will feel like when we do flamethrower drills, your entire body is going to be feeling fear. And this is in order. I want you to stand your ground. I don't care how much you want to run. I want you to experience this telepathic download. Now the guy telling me this is 6'3", six, 6'4", six, a big guy, and he said, I thought, oh, give me a break. I'm not a child. I'm ready for this. But here comes the being. It's waddling. It looks like Donald Duck in a cartoon. It makes him feel like he wants to laugh. He's hearing his boss telling him exactly what's going to happen. This thing is waddling, coming up. And he said when it got to about six feet, his entire legs began to shake. He wanted to run. He felt like he was going to faint. And he said the only thing that kept me standing there is that I knew that my superior officer was off to the left about 30 feet. And by God, I was not going to fall apart in front of him. So I stood there. But Linda, it was terrifying. And then he said, the being's head he tilted up. And he said, when those eyes met my eyes, I lost all control. He said, the best I can tell you, if you took seven Hollywood movies and you started running them through your mind all at once, sound, temperature, touch, everything is going on in seven storylines and on top of every one of the films are three-dimensional gold hieroglyphs. The symbols are running on top of all of the film. And I realized my mind is trying to ask questions, and with every question my mind is trying to ask, it's making another one of these branching movies. And his boss had told him that when you faint, will be there to catch you. And he thought that that was so, such nonsense that until that moment, with all of these films running through his head, it had never occurred to him that he would ever faint in his life, and he lost consciousness. It was three solid hours later. When he opened his eyes, he was lying in a cot in a room. They had caught him. They had put him in a bed three hours to recover, and when he opened his eyes, he was still not able to sit up and get off of the bed. And he said, Linda, that's what my superior officer wanted me to understand. We all would like, just like Spielberg's movie of the little E.T. that got drunk in the kitchen on beer, We'd like to have extraterrestrials take us to Starbucks and sit down and have coffee and tell us about the universe. And he said, it's never going to happen because the difference between the way our minds work and their minds work, they're overwhelming. And what happened is that I got a call that I might be able to talk to the man who lived with one of the Edens retrieved from the Roswell region and had been taken to Los Alamos National Lab between 1949 and June 18, 1952. When this being died, 
of unknown causes is the way the document read that I was shown. And backtracking from that death, this was the story that I was to hear from the man there at the site in Roswell. He was with a group. They had gotten word that there had been a UFO crash. There is not a date on this in terms of July 2nd to 4th, 1947, that we know that there were three crashes. This might have happened somewhere later in 48 or 49. And by then, these groups that were in Project Pounce and Moondust that were trained to come to where there was any kind of an interaction with what were being called by our government extraterrestrial biological entities, they were trained to move in a group into a location. There would be some that would pack up the, let's call it the metal wreckage or uh, technology that they found, and there would be others in the group that would be focused on the bodies, alive or dead, of the extraterrestrial biological entities. And where this story starts is that the group was moving in and they could see bodies. And the man who is talking to me said, all of a sudden, in his mind, he felt pain, he heard like a cry, high-pitched. The other men are moving, and he stops because he doesn't know. He can't see anything in front of him. But he's feeling this horror inside of his own mind, and he is absolutely paralyzed with what is happening, what is happening to me, is this something here, and he couldn't see anything. He didn't at that point say anything to the men around him. He was completely disoriented by what was happening in his head. And not only was he hearing this high pitch, he was seeing images. He said it was like I was getting flashes, like slides of something, he said, and maybe it was like I was looking through a window, maybe it was dust, maybe this was the crash, maybe this is what was happening and it's being put into my mind. And I started to move and I walked and the other men were on and I realized something is pulling me. It felt like I was being pulled by jello to come and look right at a place. And then he realizes. There's debris, there is a dark shadow, and that he walked over to the debris and he picked up something, and here is a live being, not human. And when he picked up the debris, that what came into his mind at that moment, because now it was eye-to-eye -eye contact with this being lying in the debris, was everything, what happened, how they, uh, whatever went, the malfunction, uh, what they were seeing as the craft went down, the, and the crash, all of it, and then the overriding pain that this being was feeling. And that's when he told everybody there, come, look at this. This is alive. We need to help. Because he was able to see pictures, get sound, feel emotion, it was decided that his assignment from there on out was he was going to stay with this being. They transferred both to Los Alamos. And for that period of time, as I understand, it was in the year 1949, I believe, from there to June 18, 1952, they lived together. And there were two sentences that I was told by this man of the downloads that he got during that period of time. He said it was like being with a child with the mind of a thousand men. He would have these image exchanges and thought exchanges that for some reason he could get from this being and nobody else could. Our government began realizing that they needed to find translators. They needed to find talented people 
who could get the images and the numbers and the thought words from these beings, and they started looking for translators. That's the category this man became. But he said at one point, in all of their word exchanges in their minds with seeing pictures and symbols, that this being was explaining about where they came from and the cosmos. And this sentence, or sentences, we made you, we put you here, but you have to live it. And this man looked at me and he said, Linda, you know, what I've come to understand from this being that I lived with and I loved, the machinery of this universe is reincarnation, the recycling of soul. We treat the soul and recycling like mythology. These beings seem to be communicating that the most important part of our life as human beings was the soul and what happened at the moment of death. Individuals that claim to be abducted by aliens, all of the procedures done on them seem to indicate that the aliens are interested in their DNA. And mothers, or mothers-to-be, are exposed to certain babies that are extracted from them during their pregnancy and later on are presented to them so they could uh, interact and eventually have aliens study the interaction between the mother and the fetus. So apparently, long story short, this seems to be a hybridization program run by the aliens. Now, this has been going on for many years, and people are trying to figure out what is the real purpose behind it. And the most likely hypothesis is that what the aliens are doing is that they may be using parts of our DNA that would allow them to be able to live in this planet without having any problems. In other words, oxygen is very, very toxic, especially to the DNA. But we have some special techniques in order for us to be able to counteract that, to protect ourselves and to be able to work around it. Aliens do not have this. So for instance, if they were to live in an oxygen-tested atmosphere, they would quickly develop uh, cancer. In similar fashion, we are very susceptible to radioactivity. Aliens are not. Why? Because they're crafts are always leaving residuals of radioactive uh, energy. What I'm trying to say is that if we were to go out in another planet and try to live there, we would have to be able to incorporate that inhabitant's evolution into our DNA, which will allow us to actually live in this planet without having any health hazards. And that may be the reason why they're doing all these hybridization experiments in order to create a species that formerly belongs to them, but will be able to survive in this atmosphere. And we'll be able to eat what is offered from this planet, to be able to function, to be able to see, to be able to hear, and to be able to go about in an environment just like ours. To any skeptic who says, well, these are just stories, these are just accounts. Hell, life is just stories. Life is just accounts. The entire criminal justice system, for example, is based on eyewitness testimony. When did we stop thinking eyewitness testimony was important? We put, and rightly so, a vast amount of stock in testimony. Why shouldn't we do so when that testimony comes from someone who says they've seen a UFO or they've had an alien abduction experience. With most researchers or whistleblowers, they get approached by CIA and they are subject to immense pressure to continue their research, receive funding, and at the very end, 
prove and say to everyone that that was a hoax. An example of this case is with Colin Andrews. Colin Andrews was UK's foremost expert on crop circles. So what happened was that Colin Andrews was a, a really strong figure on that uh, research field and apparently had so many followers, was approached by CIA, and these are Colin Andrews' words in an interview. He was approached and he was told that what CIA does with most of researchers is that they fund them and they keep them going and they keep them moving on up to the point where they will say publicly that this is a hoax. And lo and behold, that's exactly what happened with Mr. Colin Andrews. He went to the U.S. and received funding from Rockefeller Institute, of course, and then he came up with a interview stating that at least 80% of those crop circles are hoaxes. In the first movie, It Is Among Us, we did an analysis of the alien autopsy, presumably presented by Ray Philip back in 1995. We focused mainly on the medical aspects, on certain interesting facts, and we came up with the conclusion that that may have been an actual alien. What happens with Santilli is something that we've seen with other researchers or you know, uh, so-called whistleblowers. CIA approaches them and invites them to basically debunk everything. Later on, Santilli came up with a confession that apparently this was completely fake, that he manufactured this doll with a friend of his, that he was a, a specialist on uh, mannequin dolls, and another friend of his that uh, presumably was the surgeon that cut the body, and uh, that it was just uh, a hoax or a, a restoration of a film. So he was giving us a bit of a gray story, pretty much indicating that that was a hoax. However, if we take a very close look at this footage, again, we will see that his story doesn't add up. There's absolutely no way that his story explains what we see in this video. And this is for many reasons. One being the fact that in order to manufacture this alien that we see there, he needs skills that renders you a superb professional. No amateur can do this. No somebody that is in the field but is not doing an amazing job. So this is not an amateur who's having fun. What makes Ray Santilli completely fraudulent in his confession in him resending an explanation of the footage is the fact that in the second video where he has the debris and he's showing all the cockpits and the panels and stuff, apparently he says that uh, they came up with certain hieroglyphs that they put in those beams. But those hieroglyphs are Greek and they read eleftheria, which means freedom, which is something that Santilli never came up with in his confession. So. I think Ray Santilli must have been under a lot of pressure and he decided to actually go about, just like Colin Andrews, to play along and to completely ridicule himself. Because if he was really looking out for a career, the last thing he would ever do is to become a mockery for everyone in the field and everyone around the world. Moreover, we know that there's another video out there that shows an alien, again it's back from 1947, that shows an alien being brought into a base. Santilli has nothing to do with this. If we study that second video, we will see several faces. Apparently, that you know, people that used to serve the 509th Group at Royal New Mexico in 1947. And if we actually go back to the Museum of Roswell and we look into the archives of the people and the staff of the base, we will be able to identify the first medic that reaches over and leans over just to inspect that alien. If you look closely, that person has a deformity in his left ear, which gives him an identity. Now we can look up this person and we can find this person. And that is going to be a very strong indication that this video is authentic. And if that video is authentic, then Santilli's video is also authentic. Back in the spring of 1990, one of the subjects that was breaking up during that period of time in 1990 were crop formations. They were
were on 60 Minutes, they were on 2020. Barbara Walters was talking about how are these incredibly beautiful patterns being put down 800,000 feet long in wheat fields or barley fields or rape fields, especially in England. But that year, a lot of people don't realize, I counted the number of countries and we had crop formations being photographed in 23 countries, 1990. So by 1991, I wanted to get to England. I wanted to be able to spend time in the formations. I wanted to see what it felt like. And by the summer of 1992, I finally was landing in London and was taken to Marlborough to get to where I was going to be staying in the Vale of Pusey. For 2,000 years, the cereal crops in the Vale of Pusey in England have been associated always with the cycles of planting and harvesting. For 2,000 years, the same land has been a home to all kinds of crops. So this has been the heart of where crop formations first emerged in the 1970s. A few people knew about them, and then by 88 and 1989, were the first what they called pictograms. Some of them were 750 feet long, 800 feet long. They were largely circles with lines and odd symbols coming off of the lines. By 1992, when I landed and got to the Vale of Pusey, everything was evolving into very sophisticated patterns. There were beginning to be people who were recognizing that there was mathematical language in these crop formations. And I had not been in a formation. I had studied hundreds from the United States. And so the first thing that I wanted to do, and I joined up with friends, is to organize getting into a crop formation. And I had arrived at night, and it was the next morning. Seven of us went to one at Milk Hill, a place that's had a spectacular formation every year since around 1989. And when we got there, we parked in an area where we could park cars on a hill, and then we had to go as a group along the top of Milk Hill in order to get up above a 430 foot, I believe it was, huge. It was spirals, paths, big circles. It was not a pictogram. It was like a geometry. And I remember getting up and we got to a point right above, and some of the people who were more experienced, they said, we've got to come down where we can go down a tram line so we don't trample any of the wheat. And we all, like children, for reasons unknown, were on a hill, but we all started sort of running. And we ran all the way down into the Milk Hill tram line, going right along the Milk Hill formation. Now, there were about seven of us. I just happened, for some reason, to be the person who was at the furthest. So I am going down the tram line, the furthest this way, and everybody else was kind of spread around along here, 400 feet, bigger than a football field. I had my 35 millimeter camera hanging around my neck, and I had the curiosity to go right into this formation. I wanted to see what does it feel like to be in it. And so I'm walking with tremendous innocence, my first pattern ever on earth, and I get to an opening, and it was like I hit a wall of jello. It actually was firm and made me kind of like I bumped into a wall. I'm not seeing a wall. I'm not seeing anything but air. But I could feel there was this solidness, and I stopped, puzzled. I looked down. The others had stopped. Nobody was going into this pattern. So I brought my 35 millimeter up. I put it so I could change and go down real close and come back and wide. And I started taking photographs. And I realized when I went into a zoo in a particular place, only about five feet from where I was blocked by this whatever jello, I could see wheat this direction, wheat this direction. I could see another layer. And I thought, oh my Lord, I want to get in there. This thing is layered. And after
after about another minute or two, whatever this strange jello that had blocked apparently all of us, it just kind of evaporated. And then I felt almost like I was being invited into the crop formation at that point. I didn't want to step on anything. So I went on tippy toe for a while, like in a circle, trying to see how can I get close, how can I get photographs of the layers, and finally, my curiosity overwhelmed my desire not to step on any of this crop. And I, sort of on my tiptoes, I went to what I had been trying to photograph, and it got down on my hands and knees. I put my hand, here was the top layer, here was the layer going this direction, here was another layer, and it went down seven layers, all opposite directions, and then my fingers, I could feel the soil. I could feel the soil coming under my fingernails as I did this and realized that the top of the formation that was going like this all the way down had, was about up to maybe 12 inches. But from the soil up, this pattern was spread for 430-some feet with all of these layers. And there were not even layers. There were areas where it swirled like water in circles. There were all kinds of exquisite, nothing was out of place. It was breathtaking. And then I felt this pull to go to the right. Everybody else had gone to the far end, and at 430 feet, I'm that far away, they're that far away, but I'm pulled to the right. And as I'm walking, I'm trying to walk on the edge of my toes. But as I'm walking to go to this far end that seems to be pulling me, I'm realizing that the complexity of those seven layers and these beautiful swirls, it's continuing all of the way. And I get to the end. It's wheat that was about waist high. I'm now at the edge and can't go any further. And here it is solid, solid wheat, like you were inside of a velvet carpet, but it's wheat. And as I'm standing there, looking out on the solid wheat, and then looking in at the complexity of all of these layers, and then back out onto this wheat, it was like a thought voice. It said, life on earth is not guaranteed. And I turned again, and as I turned to look out on the wheat, it was, life on earth is not guaranteed. Suddenly, it was like when you're in the presence of something like a Bengal tiger. And the Bengal tiger can be 20 feet away from you in a zoo or a safari park. And you're protected. But when you look into the eyes of a Bengal tiger, there is not only profound intelligence, but a sense of danger. Because the intelligence is capable of doing anything. And at that moment, looking out on that wheat, it was as if a Bengal tiger was staring back at me. And I remember that moment. This is what made this pattern. This is an intelligence that is capable of destroying us or letting us live. Life on Earth is not guaranteed. And it was at that moment that every crop formation that I was ever in by the hundreds for the next decade, that voice was always there that said, this is really important. These crop formations have mathematical language. If we were smart enough, we would all be sharing what is the language in these crop formations and praying that that Bengal tiger intelligence knew that a lot of us actually cared about whether we survive on Earth or not. Back in 1992, during my first trip to England, as I began moving into crop formations and feeling them out, a lot of us started saying, you know, this formation, it feels really positive and I feel good, but I was in that one over on the barn road and it felt terrible. And that made me start thinking, what if 
there are two types of energy, two types of intelligences that are even competing with each other in the crops of the world, like the skin of the world. And that where we feel really good in some, it may be something that is trying to inspire us to give us joy, to give us exaltation, which I felt in those crop formations. And those that made me feel sick or that made me stop, that was the beginning of these crop formations are not equal. Not all are positive and not all are negative, but when they are negative, it had a physical impact on the body and I think the mind and the soul that many of us who came to go to crop formations together would have this moment where this I have to leave. Now what else was interesting about this? I began to realize that over the 10 or 12 years that I kept going to England, that the crop formations, if this was going to happen, where you felt like you were sucked with air, it was going to be in something like an eight-fold geometry or a five-fold geometry or maybe an 11-fold. It was never a three. It was never a six. It was never a seven. And it was never a nine. And in the whole issue of sigils and ancient geometries and mathematical laws being underneath the sacred geometry, it was one of those evolutions that people who were mathematicians began to study in detail and put on websites what they were finding in terms of mathematical ratios and crop formations. And eventually, I remember one of the first dialogues I had with people. Did you ever feel that when you were in an eight-fold geometry that it was different than the six-fold geometry across the field? And there had been one specific example where there were six or seven of us. And there had been a, a windmill hill. And there had been an eight-fold geometry. And then in the field right opposite, it was a six-fold. And all of us who had gone into the eight-fold geometry, when we got into the six-fold, everybody was saying, there is a difference. Could it be that those behind certain geometry, whatever the intelligence, are in conflict with everything that is behind the three, the six, the nine, the seven geometry? You will see that the flower of life, which begins with threes that go to sixes, that go to nines, that that is associated with what is called the light or the Christ light. If you go to the eight, that eight geometry is associated with Mesopotamia and ancient sigils as if math numbers, associations with things in the unseen are part of the fabric of what is behind the crop formations that have occurred on this planet. It may be subtle to many people, but the challenge is we need to understand why it is that a place like Glastonbury, with the red and white springs that have been going since they say for 2,000 years, and that Arimathea brought Christ there, and that there is a relationship between this land where crop formations seem to have focused, could it be that it isn't just math, that it isn't just something from another intelligence, that the crop formations themselves go to the heart of something that is trying to get human attention, that the soul of humanity is at stake, that life is not guaranteed, and that the crop formations seem to be spelling out that there is conflict between light and dark, numbers and mathematical language. And that has always been with me ever since I spent so much time in them, that it goes beyond beauty, it goes beyond poetry, it goes beyond mathematical language, that the crop formations that began coming to this planet in the 1970s has something to do with a philosophical argument 
about what is allowable to do with life. And that the crop formations, to me, today in 2017, the crop formations have always been like a signal. I've always felt they were a signal. We have a path that we can go to life, or we have a path we can go to death. And something like that Bengal tiger intelligence is watching, provoking, waiting, and I hope inspiring the move to life.